Good afternoon and welcome to Accelerating B2B E-commerce for Mid-Market Manufacturers. We, uh, we are going to jump in now. We do have some participants that will still be joining in, in the next couple of minutes. However, for the sake of time, we are going to start. A couple housekeeping items as we begin the webinar. We will be recording this webinar. A copy of the deck and the webinar will be available after the webinar. We will also be taking questions at the end of the webinar. And if there are questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A feature that is built into this Zoom uh, recording. And with that, we're gonna jump in and we are going to quickly go through the agenda for today. We'll spend a few minutes on introductions of the three people who are leading the webinar. We'll talk about the state of B2B sales, we're going to talk a little bit about a pilot program, how to get to market faster with B2B e-commerce. We'll talk about platform considerations and take into account both the short-term as well as the long-term needs when looking at B2B e-commerce. And then we're going to also talk about a very popular topic, Amazon. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Beck to introduce himself. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, hey, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Wonderful. So hello, everyone. My name is Brian Beck. I'm the author of a book called Billion Dollar B2B E-Commerce. It's the industry's first book all about uh, really a playbook for B2B companies to get into e-commerce. 400 pages and 12 chapters of really everything you need to do uh, to get into the uh, uh, business. Um, I've been in the e-commerce field for 20 years myself. I'm also the managing partner of a company called Enciba. At Enciba, we have a practice focused on helping companies in the B2B side really focus on and build their e-commerce strategy for Amazon and Amazon business and then execute on that. Uh, I've been the VP of e-commerce in a number of places, uh, largely on the consumer side, and now really been working on the B2B side for about five years. And so I'm excited to be presenting to you today, and I'll be sharing some concepts out of the book and from my experience. So I think we're turning it over to Andy for his introduction. Andy? Thanks, Brian. So I'm on the services side as well. And in the services side of the world, we are really defined by our clients and had the privilege uh, over the last 20 years or so to work for some fantastic clients out there, uh, both in the consumer and on the business side. Uh, the firm I work for is called Intara, and we are a consultancy and design and build house for B2B e-commerce websites, as well as other uh, audience defining experiences. Uh, my name is Andy Didick. I'm the VP of sales and marketing there. Great, thank you, Andy. And my name is Tom Falero. I'm the VP of marketing and business development at Zenode, which is a product of Amla Commerce. I have over 10 years of experience in e-commerce and digital marketing and really have focused on the integration of branding, marketing, and digital commerce in both B2C and B2B in my career. Today, what we're gonna talk about when we talk about the, and get into some platform selections, we're gonna, and to introduce Zenote is an enterprise B2B e-commerce platform that's widely adopted by leading manufacturers and distributors. And some of the things that we talk about with a pilot program versus the long-term is, um, and I'll share some of this in the considerations is, the uh, ability to have speed to market without compromising for the future. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Tom. So um, you all, hopefully, first and foremost, everyone's staying safe and healthy through this time. The COVID-19 is the loudest call to action anyone's heard for, in our lifetime, really, for B2B digital transformation and e-commerce. And I think this chart, which is from Bank of America Forest and Forrester, really shows it well. Uh, I've been in this field for 20 years and I've seen the growth, which has been incremental and growing you know, really every single year in terms of penetration of e-commerce buying uh, in the United States. And what we see here is in the last three months, or really the last five months now, we've seen 10 years of growth. So through 2019, the penetration of e-commerce was about 16%, and you can see there it's grown from 2009 from 5% up. And so what does this mean? Boy, it means that people are turning to e-commerce as a place to find product, research, and buy product like never before. It's close to 35% now. Uh, and you may say a lot of this has to do with consumers, and it does, but it also has quite a bit and quite a few implications 
uh, with regard to B2B. So why don't we go ahead to the next slide, Tom. And by the way, I see your cursor moving, so you can maybe hold that steady. Um, so COVID-19 uh, has really forced the hand, I like to say, of e-commerce in B2B. Because if you think about it, homebound B2B buyers have no other way to buy products in many cases. And buyers that have been reticent to use e-commerce are now being forced to. So if you think about your contractors in the field, electrical contractors or HVAC contractors or medical and dental offices, um, companies that have never bought online uh, using e-commerce are now being forced to and turning there. In fact, 50% of customers are buying products they've never bought before online. This is according to Forrester Research. This is, this is released just a month ago. Almost half of businesses are experiencing online sales growth. And you know, our bellwether for this e-commerce industry in many ways is Amazon, as we think about you know, their 50% uh, share of US e-commerce. Amazon sales are up 35% year over year. They, they released earnings recently, you can see these numbers. They've hired close to 200,000 people to support demand. These are mind boggling numbers, but Amazon is doing more volume now than it does in, in, many, in many of its recent holiday periods. So these behaviors, I believe, are, are going to be ingrained. If we think about quote unquote normalcy, it's not likely to return until sometime next year, you know, without social distancing, et cetera. And, and you know, you, you, you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, let's get back to normalcy when, you know, the sales teams can call on, on people and, and doors are open, et cetera. But what's happening too is that when companies realize and understand or buyers understand that the uh, process of using e-commerce to make transactions is easier and makes their job faster and, and less painful, they stay with these behaviors and we, we expect these, these behaviors to sustain. So e-commerce, that 10-year acceleration is real and it's gonna stay with us. Go ahead to the next slide, Tom. So what do you do when the doors are closed? Well, the fact of the matter is many offices and commercial locations across the United States and the world are closed due to COVID-19. In fact, as of May, uh, according to the Global CFO Council, 75% of US workforce was working remotely and this is becoming a new norm. Up to 30% of the workforce will still be working from home at the end of next year. Think about that. And buyers are not accepting as many in-person meetings, certainly today, but going forward with this remote workforce, you're gonna be less able to, as a sales team, get into these uh, offices. So is this death of a salesman? And you know, how, how does the sales team do their job in this environment? No, it's not. In fact, I, I make the case in the book, I have a whole chapter on sales enablement and how digital can actually enable the sales force to be more effective. And Tom's gonna to talk about that a little bit later in the context of a pilot program. Uh, it really just raises the importance of, of channel alignment. And so let's take a look at this study here from Gartner Group. This is, this is really, uh, uh, I love the way they talk about this in the study. Your linear B2B sales process has been lying to you. Wow, <laughs> so that's a pretty uh, incriminating uh, 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 sentence there. Well, what they're trying to say is that this isn't about e-commerce working on its own or handing off leads to your sales team. If you look at the data in the center of this slide here, it shows that through the entire sales process from probable identification all the way through consensus creation and purchase, that the B2B buyers who use, use both the sales reps and the website interchangeably to complete a purchase, they're, they're using one to balance off against the other. They have to work together. This isn't about a handoff. And so we need to be thinking about that in the course of, of launching a pilot and accelerating your, your e-commerce efforts. Go ahead to the next slide, Tom. The fact of the matter is most B2B companies aren't ready for all these changes. In fact, B2B companies are 10 to 15 years behind their retail peers in terms of digital maturity. Only 50% of B2B companies have an e-commerce site. And in this survey by Digital Commerce 360 here on the right, this is last year, 2019, only six out of 300 manufacturers, 2%, generate more than 10% of their sales from e-commerce. It's just the state of the industry today. Uh, and, and, and frankly, many companies have been reliant for a long time on their resellers to do the digital job or the resale job for them. So go ahead to the next slide, Tom. The, 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 the challenge for manufacturers is the field of 
people who are reselling the product are going is going to thin through this COVID-19 process or a pandemic. There is going to be fewer buying options for all kinds of buyers once this pandemic has passed. As a matter of fact, in in uh, just a few months ago, Digital Commerce did a survey showing that B2B businesses have taken a hit. 63% of businesses reporting a downturn. If you follow the retail marketplace, for example, we've seen major bankruptcies, JCPenney, GNC, lots of other businesses that are filing for bankruptcy as, as they have challenges. We believe the same kinds of dynamics are, are happening and coming to uh, the distributor marketplace and the dealer marketplace. Many of you, many of the clients we work with and we focus large, largely on manufacturers have experienced in their traditional dealer network uh, companies that are either closed because they're physically based retail or distribution points, or they have had have seen themselves down downtrends in their business. While that field will thin, those who are prepared are actually winning. So go ahead to the next slide, Tom. So any of you are familiar with Watsco, for example, they're a leading HVAC distributor, uh, public company. You can look at their numbers. Um, they launched their e-commerce site in 2014. Its e-commerce is a third of their total sales. This is not a small company, by the way. And in the most recent quarter, they reported 12% growth in e-commerce and 8% overall sales growth during the pandemic. Why? Because their buyers are discovering e-commerce, almost 100% increase in the use of the mobile app by their contractors. These are HVAC folks in the field that are taking advantage of their, their features such as buy online and have it ready for me for pickup outside the distribution branch in the next morning or ship the product directly to my work site or job site so I don't have to go into the, the, into the facility. The point here is that companies that have invested in digital channels are capturing market share right now. Um, the good news in all this though is that it, it isn't too late for you to start investing and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Go ahead to the next slide, Tom. This all translates to a very loud call to action for digital uh, enablement and digital rela relationships. And really uh, what we're taking out of this is that the building these virtual relationships is now the primary way customers and sellers will interact. And it's not just e-commerce, it's multiple points here. So we think about buying and researching and shifting, that shifting to digital channels, but it's beyond that. The point I was making about digitized sales teams, teams in the field using mobile applications to communicate product availability and communicate product information or conducting meetings through virtual means. Think about your own uh, conferences and ed education seminars and things that B2B businesses have done for years to educate, create leads and generate qualified uh, prospects. All those things are shifting to digital uh, formats. Hiring is moving to digital formats. My business is hiring people. We're doing it all digitally. We're, we're, we're screening people through, through, uh, through, through Skype and, and Zoom meetings and things. And it's just it, that, that whole dynamic is changing. And then of course, you've got digitally connected remote workforces. Remember 30 plus percent are gonna be working remotely even, even as, the end, as of the end of next year. So what does all of this mean? It means a new B2B buyer is really being, being defined by COVID-19 and that B2B buyer is, is digitized in this relationship really is enabled digitally across all of these different functions. So what do you do about all of this, particularly if you're a manufacturer who is, has no real digital uh, chops or e-commerce? Well, part, the rest of our webinar here today is designed to help you think through some things you can do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andy now to talk about a, a, a pilot program and how you can implement that for your business. Thank you, Brian. So. Brian's done a fantastic job of teeing up the why anything needs to be done. And I, I think there's some fantastic numbers in there and statistics. But if you're attending today or listening to this later on, you probably already have a sense of urgency and understand the importance that e-commerce will play in your strategy as a manufacturer going forward. Uh, and if you have your ducks in a row, you actually can get to market in four to six months with an e-commerce pilot program. Uh, it is difficult to get your ducks in a row. Brian's written a book with 400 pages on how to do that. Uh, I, I have a consulting practice uh, within Intara that that's, that's what we help folks to do, but it is, it is entirely possible. We can't cover it all today. What we're going to do though is 
go through and share with you five things that successful B2B e-commerce pilots have in common. But before we get into those, I'd like to go, and I don't know if there are any other history nerds out there like myself, but I went to figure out what is the origin of the word pilot because we must have said it to each other 400 times in preparing for this webinar. And what's interesting is it actually originates from the age of exploration. And it was the name of a person, it's a noun, it was actually referred to the person who hung off the front of a ship and they were responsible for navigating in and out of man-made and natural harbors, which is the most dangerous time to be on a ship. It's kind of like most accidents occur within five minutes of, of home. Most accidents for ships occur when they're going in and out of port. It's a really dangerous time. Uh, and because of all the exploration that was going on, this, this person, this job became quite specialized. And it also became a verb. And I'm, I'll go ahead and read this definition to you here. The verb means to guide, lead, direct the course of, especially through an intricate or perilous passage. And I cannot think of a more appropriate phrase for what it's like to launch an e-commerce pilot, especially right now, than an intricate or perilous passage. So what we'll do now is talk about what those five key, uh, keys to success are. Um, the first one is that you pilot programs in the manufacturing space know what success is. They've defined what they're moving toward. It's not necessarily what the end game is because you're not going to know that going in. I think there are a lot of examples out there, certainly with our clients, um, with others, Brian's written about several in the book that talk about, uh, or that we understand, you started with an understanding of one place and you ended up in a much different one. What's important here is that uh, pilots know you've got to get into the game. Um, and also understanding what the piloting process truly entails. So we have a map here on the right. This is an old map from that age of exploration. And what's important to know is that uh, the, the pilots back then, they didn't just hop in a boat and circumnavigate Africa. They went down the, uh, the coast, they went from port to port, and then they'd return back and write down what they had learned and give that map to the next crew who would then go down and go a little bit further and a little bit further. That process is, has to be kept in mind when you're developing this pilot because you're not going to get it all right coming out of the gate. You're also not going to have a complete experience, which brings us to the third point of knowing what success is. Success for this pilot project is getting in the game. It's not having all the kinks necessarily worked out. It has to function and work, but you're going to add to this over time. And, and while we're on that subject of, well, what do we sell? That's a great place that you need to start. If we go back to where e-commerce started, some of us have this image locked in our mind of this is all that e-commerce is good for are things like Beanie Babies. And you know, I went into Brian Beck's uh, web, uh, web history and pulled out some things he's been looking at. And you can, you can what's that in the search bar? Um, but we, you, you think about that, don't, don't let that limit your thinking that it's only small things that can be easily shipped to the mail because you can get online today, right now, click a button and have an 800 ton crane delivered to your doorstep uh, using Iron Planet and other heavy equipment, industrial equipment, scientific equipment, it's all being sold online right now. So don't limit your thinking and say, we can't move that. Uh, it, either direct to consumer or, I know we're here primarily to talk about B2B, but don't have that direct consumer limiting mindset when we're thinking about running a pilot program. So the second thing that successful pilots understand is they know where to start. So manufacturers have a built-in advantage for starting pilot programs. Brian shared at the beginning that they're 10 to 15 years behind retail. I would wholeheartedly agree with that from my consulting experience. But one thing that they have that's a real advantage is a dedicated field sales team. This sales team is out there building strong relationships and those strong relationships are what you're going to use to start your, pro your pilot program. Most of the clients we work with begin they, they, by selecting an elite group of customers that they've had long-standing relationships with that are very durable and ask them the favor of helping them to design this program in a way that will solve their business challenges. That's a very effective way to go and it puts you in the, the driver's seat to further deepen those customer relationships. Uh, successful pilot programs also, actually if we can go back, there's a couple other uh, items on there. They, they, you wanna select your product offerings carefully and make sure that you are choosing products that you are comfortable that you can move via e-commerce to your, uh, I'm sorry, selecting products you, you're sure that you can move via e-commerce and that you've got decent data for, which we'll talk about in a minute. And you also want to align with your field sales team. Um, this is, you could do a webinar just on this topic alone, but 
Field sales has the relationship, they have the pulse of the customer. In my experience, there are two different types of field salespeople, ones that welcome e-commerce with open arms, and ones that are filled with abject terror at the idea of having it out there. But I think in this day and age, most people understand that it's inevitable. So you've got to align with this group and uh, make sure you're, you're handling their concerns as well as looking to them to help you select your audience. And then finally, successful pilot programs don't ignore the channel. Um, some channel conflict is inevitable, but it's also become very commonplace and is not something most of our clients, I'd say 10 years ago, that was at the top of their concerns list. Nowadays, it's, it's there and it's present, but instead of being afraid of the channel, they're thinking about how can I use the data that I'm going to get through e-commerce to empower the channel, or in the case of manufacturers, they're thinking, hey, this is actually a pretty great deal for my distributors that I'm gonna hand a sale to that's already packaged up and ready to go uh, and have them fulfill. And that's, that's on the, if you're selling directly to the end buyer and you know, kind of going around that distributor, but in many cases, selling directly to distributors, especially smaller ones, they're, they're already screaming for e-commerce saying, get me off of these fax machines and emailed orders that I know for you manufacturers out there are still pouring in as a primary way of communicating with some of your clients. The third thing that successful pilots have in common is they know how to deploy. Uh, this is really important. There's a, a very brief flow chart here on the right. But those of us that have done this a lot over and over again, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. I want to share with this group today the number one cause of project delay and cost overruns that we've seen in terms of deployment, and that is actually the state of product data. So you have to learn, um, you have to select your products that you can port for an e-commerce project very carefully. One of that cri those criteria has to be that the data is clean, the data is complete, and the data is ready to ingest into an e-commerce platform. And that last piece is really important. Most manufacturers we talk to and that we're, we're doing pilots with have the same experience internally. They've, they've bootstrapped things over the year in IT. They have developed methodologies internally using spreadsheets and multiple people to be able to correlate their product data. And it's gotten to a point where, yes, whoever's in the, at the front desk with 20 years of experience knows where the gaps are and can process them. But even the best e-commerce platform requires clean product data in order to uh, be able to function correctly. So this, if I go into a manufacturer cold and they tell me, oh yeah, our product data is in great shape, that's a big red flag for me. And it's something that we go and investigate right away. The, the second part of successful deployments is they're using the agile framework and they're having iterative reviews, including with that client group. You remember that client group we talked about on uh, a few slides ago? You need to solicit their help both at the beginning to find out, hey, what's really your business challenge here? How is it that we can solve this for you? But you also need to include them at different points along this development cycle. They have key things they're going to tell you that will help define what will make the pilot successful method of payment, uh, popular items they want to see, methods of delivery and shipping, other things that you should never assume. And by involving them in the process iteratively, you're doing two things. The first is you're helping to make sure using this agile framework that your pilot's going to be successful when it, when it launches. The second thing is you're conditioning this group at each one of these intersections of review to not expect a completely seamless, uh, perfect 10 years worth of effort experience with the e-commerce pilot. They're part of the skunk works that's working to develop this and they're getting some ownership of it so that when it goes live, they know what to expect, they know how to use it, no training is required and they're ready to go. Item four is that manufacturers that are piloting understand the required people and platforms that are required. Uh, this is an important one. We actually just had a, a very large, uh, we have a very large client. They're two, about $2 billion manufacturer of heavy equipment, lift trucks. And they asked us to do some consulting and an assessment to help them get their B2B pilot off the ground. One of the key findings that we, that we uncovered for them was that while they had many of the things in place, they didn't have enough internal IT staff in order to really support the project, particularly the product data. They've got, I think, 90,000 SKUs that they're working with. And they took this 
from us very seriously. They actually delayed the project for about a month, which had us all sitting on the edge of our seats. But they did hire the folks that were required, and that project is now off and running, which is fantastic. So understand what is required to staff this, that it's going to involve lots of people throughout the organization. It doesn't have to be a, a massive, uh, you know, storming Normandy is something we talk about with long, long-term planning and hundreds of people, but it does have to have the right expertise. And to that end, really consider hiring co-pilots that have done this before. Uh, one of my factoids I've got from the age of exploration is that when the, the person who's at the helm of that ship had a really dangerous job unless they had done it a bunch of times. And in order to accelerate exploration, what uh, many countries would do is hire local pilots from the area they wanted to explore because they could move so much faster. You need to do the same thing. Uh, Brian, I know this is something that you write about in your book, the importance of bringing expertise in from the outside. And I'd love to get your, your thoughts here uh, to contribute yeah. to the conversation, the importance of that. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's funny, Andy, and this is a great, great point you're making. And too often I find that B2B companies, they, they don't hire for the right kind of expertise or they, they don't hire and give the right authority um, and visibility to the person. So one of the, one of the, I give a bunch of examples in the book. One of the areas I talk about, and I have a case study, for example, on Beckman Coulter, which is a life sciences company, and they've they hired someone out of um, out of B2C who understands, you know, the retail e-commerce to really lead the lead this effort. And, you know, look, oftentimes B2B companies, you know, they value loyalty and uh, long, long tenures. But I've often seen that either the, you know, you're giving the e-commerce and digital transformation to someone in IT who understands how to code but doesn't really know or maybe knows the product. But quite frankly, where I've seen more success, whether that's Beckman Coulter or Illumina or many other places where, you know, these are companies that have generated manufacturers that have generated significant e-commerce results um, in the hundreds of millions in some cases, they've hired people from B to C to lead some of these efforts. And the other important aspect of that, um, Andy, is that they're giving them real accountability, real authority. They report, they have a they have at least a director title, if not a VP or C-level title, and they're reporting to the CEO or the board of the company. And you know, if, if that that isn't there, it's you're less likely to succeed. Um, they have to have real accountability and authority. Thanks for that, Brian. Absolutely agree, 100%. Uh, if especially for manufacturers that are coming out of a, sort of a digital isolation phase, is something we talk about they really have to have executive support to make this happen and hiring from the outside with uh, getting an, an internal champion that has authority can be a really big boon to, to pushing through both both because of the expertise they bring and the transformative effect that that outside voice can bring inside uh, and then briefly I'll, I'll talk a little bit about platforms here but tom's going to cover that much more in the next section there, in, for your end game, where you'll end up as a manufacturer, you have to consider many platforms. It's likely you're going to be involved, um, especially if you have a lot of SKUs that are complex, you'll probably need product information management at some point, um, or you, you'll also need to consider digital asset management, uh, integrations with your ERP, the systems go on and on, there's enough acronyms for everybody. But with the right platform that can scale, you can start with just an e-com platform especially if you're looking to go in four to six months with a subset of your total SKUs, the right e-commerce platform is something that you can get started with and then expand into integrations afterwards. That's another best practice that we're seeing in order to make sure pilots are getting off the ground effectively. And then finally, successful pilots also know how to manage and measure. I think that we have just on a personal note, gotten to this place with the amount of analytics that we have available to us that is absolutely insane. It's paralyzing. We have uh, some, some clients and have had some over the years that are very, very into data. They've got dashboards with 20 different sections on them and, and maybe 15 pages because you can measure everything. And that's a great place to be if you're in a mature organization with a mature e-commerce practice and you understand if you tweak your search algorithm, where to look to see where the results are. That is not what you should be doing for a pilot program. You really need to focus on your business goal and what you're trying to accomplish. The most important thing I can tell you about this is that you need to, with a B2B program, focus on 
solving the business problems of your target audience, and retaining your existing customers. Your goal is not to set up a storefront that you're gonna bring in and convert brand new customers without having a relationship with you previously. That doesn't really work for a pilot. It's very difficult to be successful that way. Therefore, when you look at the top metrics you need to measure, starting with return visits is very important. And this is a, this is a common web statistic, but when you think about the other things that are part of an e-commerce program other than just ringing the cash register and being able to check out, there are dealer portal functions that are critical, such as being able to check your order status, your account, look at frequently purchased items, even interact with your sales rep through the e-com platform. Return visits tell you if your customers are finding value there beyond just the ability to transact. Of course, you need to be measuring traffic overall so you have a, a sense of volume and the conversion rate. Uh, great news, anyone who's familiar with B2C e-commerce where you know, good conversion rate could be considered 0.8%, 1%. Uh, we have several clients with B2B conversion rates of 8% or higher, some even much higher, because you're arriving with an intent to, to purchase and to transact on the site. Tracking that's really important. Same way with average order value. What this can reveal to you are the types of transactions that your customers are finding valuable. They may be only be they may be stuck in that beanie baby mentality where they're only ordering small things and not thinking about the way that the business could benefit from others. This is another place where having your field sales involved can be really critical because they understand the nature of that client and what they're trying to order there. Order velocity, that's pretty self-explanatory. You wanna make sure that that is staying at a pretty constant rate or whatever is uh, appropriate for you seasonally so that it is a leading indicator as to whether or not there's any lack in demand or someone isn't finding value in using the platform. And then number five, it's listed as number five here, but it's, it's probably the most neglected metric to consider, and that's site search, both external and on-site, on-site search. I've had so many people say, Andy, this site, it, SEO doesn't matter because everything's gated to, or we don't expose our product catalog to the world or whatever. And the reality is that for all of our manufacturing and distribution clients that are on e -com, if you look at their number one source of converting traffic, it's from organic search. And the reason is simple. That's the number one place that people start to do product research. It's in Google. Even your customers that know what that crazy long item number is, they start there. And then similarly with on-site search, this is another area you don't want to neglect because you want your customers to use this site without having to contact your rep. And, and the search engine itself is kind of like having your rep on the site, uh, being able to answer the question of where is this thing? So that's a really brief overview of the five things that make a successful pilot for a manufacturer. Uh, just for simplicity's sake, so you've got them consolidated. We've got them all here on the next slide for you. So the, the top five things successful B2B e-commerce pilots know. Number one, they know what success is. Two, they know where to start. Three, they know how to deploy. Four, what people and platforms are required. And five, they know how to measure and manage for maximum effect. And now we'll get to the next part of the presentation, which is about how do you choose a platform in the midst of all of this? What do you need to consider uh, to have something that can start you on this pilot journey and then scale you to enterprise and beyond? Tom? Great, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'll jump in with an interesting statistic, and um, this is really coming from two different, uh, two different sources. One is from Digital Commerce 360, and the other is from anecdotal conversations with analysts at Forrester Research. But 72 to 86 percent of companies will change e-commerce platforms in the next two years. And so while this is not a great statistic, it does actually allow companies that are just getting into e-commerce and choosing a platform to learn from some of the mistakes and the sins of the past. And for those who are already maybe evolving into their next platform to also learn from the mistakes of the past. So why are 72 to 86 percent of companies changing e-platform or e-commerce platforms? Often it's, it's a couple different mentalities. One is we're gonna dip our toe in the water. We're just gonna test something out. And we're gonna test something out with an open source platform that's free, although there is no such thing as free as we all know. There are always hidden costs and typically the more free something is, the more the hidden costs grow. Oftentimes it's choosing a traditional B2C platform because not understanding all the requirements and the long-term needs for B2B e-commerce. 
and sometimes cost does become a factor. Um, the problem with that is, is that in B2B, especially for mid-market manufacturers, this is what the next five years look like. And I'm gonna get into this a little bit more in a couple slides, but moving from a pilot to sales portals to enable your salespeople to work with channels, international sites, true B2B functionality on a site, um, channel support with unique business models, and then the internet of things. The unknown, in five years, the world will look radically different in, in being prepared for that. So if you look at choosing a platform and going through a pilot program, what are the things that are really, really relevant? I'm gonna go through these quickly and give some examples, and they, they really build on what Andy just shared with us in his last couple slides. So one is out-of-box B2B themes. As Andy said, don't think that you're gonna start with something perfect. Use themes and templates for the front end presentation layer that are already built on best practices. Get to market quickly. In six months, 12 months, you'll have much more data to tell you if you need to make changes to those themes and templates, and you'll be able to make those adjustments quickly versus starting with a long process. Two is configure versus code. Many platforms today still require lots of coding and lots of development. And as you add B2B functionality to a B2C platform, that code development and that need only gets greater, but that also means all of that code needs to be maintained and it will impact the ability to upgrade a platform in the future. And often what we see is really two paths when a company has chosen the wrong platform is one, they either continue to build custom developed code on that platform, which again becomes more and more costly, or they begin buying multiple platforms. They start out with a pilot, maybe they keep it, they buy a second platform for B2B. Maybe that doesn't work well for supporting their wholesale division and they buy a third platform. And pretty soon over the course of five years, they've either replatformed, built a uh, large code base that's hard to maintain, or they're now maintaining four or five different platforms instead of one. Site search Andy touched on is the number one driver or number one measure of customer success in B2B. Product information and being able to manage that product information centrally in your e-commerce platform and enrich it. And then, of course, in B2B e-commerce, the number one thing is having accounts versus just users and being able to present data such as account-based pricing, et cetera, allowing your accounts to self-service, log in, see their order history, et cetera. And a lot of that data then means that the platform has to integrate with the ERP system. And traditional B2C platforms, uh, particularly open source platforms, were never meant to exchange lots of data with an ERP because priceless in B2C, such as MSRP or map pricing, are very stagnant. They're not dynamic by specific account. So we recommend, again, using out-of-box B2B themes, uh, which get a company to market much, much faster using that data over time to make, cha uh, to make changes as necessary. Starting out with site search, Andy hit on this and I'll hit on it again. It is the number one measure of customer success in B2B e-commerce. Using account-based pricing, it's very common for both manufacturers and distributors to share their catalog, but not actually share a price until a user logs in and then or an account, a user who's part of an account to log in and then sharing that price once that person is logged in because they typically have pre-negotiated contracts and that pricing has existed even before the e-commerce journey. Typically it's stored in the ERP, however, it can also be cached in an e-commerce platform. And then finally, the ability to have your customers, whether it's an end customer or whether it's a channel, log in, go to a dashboard, see their order history, if they have quotes, pending orders, et cetera, and really manage themselves. So here's what transformation looks like in the next five years and why it's important to look at not only the pilot, but where you wanna be in the next five years and knowing that there's a lot of unknowns in the next five years, but as Brian alluded to on the very first slide is the acceleration of B2B e-commerce and the acceleration of digital transformation is only moving faster because of COVID but the expectations on the back end of COVID will have radically changed. 
So I'm gonna to touch on a couple different things here to think about when choosing a platform. And ideally, again, rather than having lots of customizations or adding two, three, and four different platforms to do this, trying to do this centrally in one platform. So when you move from your pilot store, you're gonna to wanna to immediately move to a couple different areas. First of all, you're gonna to need to integrate into your ERP and pull and exchange data from your ERP. So having middleware or being able to extend APIs to pull that data is absolutely crucial. Two, as Brian alluded to, sales enablement is the new game. There is no death of a salesman. What's actually happening is that salespeople need to move from being relationship, man, uh, relationship based to helping customers uh, with product selection, helping them buy online, uh, maybe even completing orders for them online. So having a sales portal where a specific salesperson can log in, see their specific channel partners that they work with, understanding what are the top selling products, if there's any quotes out, having lots and lots of data to help them make decisions and inform the customer in that path to purchase. It also means that inside salespeople and customer service reps can also play part in this and help order on behalf of a customer if that customer is having some, uh, some issues in choosing the right product or just holding their hand through that journey. Another component is international commerce. If a manufacturer is going to stand up a site, over time they are going to get inquiries from around the globe about their products. They're probably going to be able to uh, build new channel partners across the globe and mid-market manufacturers typically do sell international. Often when we talk with customers, the initial, if they're new to e-commerce, the initial conversation is, can you do multilingual uh, in multi-currency and the answer is yes, but there are bigger considerations. The ability to easily stand up catalogs specific to a region or even catalogs specific to a channel partner in a region and then apply a specific theme for that region. So you're speaking to the buyer with pictures and content in their own region, as well as obviously the currency and the language. The ability to manage different versions of B2B e-commerce. It could be that there are some direct sales where specific customers can log in, buy direct, have their own unique pricing. Or as Andy alluded to, there's also being able to serve channels through distributor portals and having those channels logged in in their own specific store with their own specific catalog and pricing and helping them as they move towards self-service online. You'll also see the Internet of Things, or IoT. We're already seeing this a lot in the, in the distribution side of B2B e-commerce, where progressive distributors have stood up vending machines on-site in manufacturing facilities, where MRO products or safety products can be purchased real-time, and those are connected through the Internet to an actual e-commerce uh, platform or through a catalog. However, in the future, manufacturers, especially as 5G technology becomes the norm, when we talk about cellular technology, devices will be connected. It'll be much easier to get maintenance data from specific products that are developed. It'll be able to be easier to sell maintenance programs and to share data with distributors and channels. So having an API first platform that can uh, exchange data easily with third party systems, if you will, whether that's a vending machine or whether it's a soft good that has a chip embedded will be absolutely crucial. And then finally, many manufacturers have complex channel support um, needs. So that could be B to B to B situations or B to B to C situations where a manufacturer may have dealers and they want to stand up a store on behalf of their dealer and help their dealer through the e-commerce journey and maybe even pick up some of that cost or charge their dealer a nominal fee to have that store stood up. And so those B2B2B models and B2B2C not models also need to be supported. And again, a lot of this does depend upon uh, specifically um, the business model of the manufacturer. But the biggest takeaways here are is that this is what five years of digital transformation looks like. And while making a pilot choice, you have to have a plan and think about what is the long term, even though there are lots of unknowns. There needs to be lots of flexibility in the platform the ability to run multi-store. And then finally, circling back to the original stat of 72 to 86% of companies are all replatforming, to avoid that headache of either having to replatform every two years 
or buy a second and third and fourth e-commerce platform every two to three years to support your changing business. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Brian to talk a little bit about Amazon. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Hey, Tom, go back to the last slide for a second. There's two, two points I wanna, I wanna actually reinforce here. One, and I had an entire chapter about platform selection in the book, chapter nine. But you know what Tom just said about flexibility is really critical. Uh, it, it, it's you know I've I've re-platformed myself, platform choice, and and decide on the right go forward. And and flexibility is really the number one thing here that Tom's talking about. Um, you ought to be able to live with your platform for ten years or more. The second thing I'll, I'll just mention really quickly is um, you got to be careful. I was on the phone two days ago, just a quick story, with a with a mid market manufacturer, probably like some of those on the phone with us today. And you know, the key here is also not just sort of solving for that first piece pilot store alone, um, and go with a, sort of a consumer like platform that you know that is easy to use and implement. You have to really be thinking about these other pieces. And this company I was referring to is now suffering through the pain of having to undo what they've done in this consumer platform and, and now re-platform into something else. So there's a, uh, those are real legitimate things Tom was talking about. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide, Tom, thanks. Um, so just a couple of quick slides. Now Amazon Business, so my role with Enceba, our company manages Amazon programs for manufacturers in the B2B side. And there's a lot of advantages uh, really to getting started uh, down this path, you know, in addition to a pilot program. With, with using Amazon, um, you know, and many, comp many folks don't realize really how large and pervasive Amazon is becoming on the B2B side. If you look at this chart on the left here, uh, this is a Digital Commerce 360 study uh, done last year in 2019. Over 50% of B2B buyers make at least 10% of their work purchases on Amazon business. And in fact, Amazon business is projected to be $52 billion in revenue by 2023. Uh, wake up call for all of us, if any of you know the business Granger, that makes it five times the size of Granger. Amazon business is not just about uh, office supplies, it's about a lot of other things too, medical products, uh, uh, dental products, you've got uh, products in multiple categories here. The, the point here is a, as a manufacturer is Amazon business is a place where uh, business buyers are increasingly going to research and buy products. It can be a lower capital investment to get started, um, in faster time to market. Um, so it's a way for you to take advantage of what Amazon has already built in terms of their high levels of traffic and high revenue potential. Amazon business is the business to business uh, sort of arm of Amazon. It's not a separate site, by the way, it's the same website. It just puts a B2B layer on top of Amazon. So if a B2B buyer comes to Amazon is registered, they can then use uh, and see all these B2B options. Amazon is investing in its B2B arm. They continue to invest heavily. Um, and when you prepare content for Amazon, we see this with a lot of our clients, you can then use it for your pilot. You can use it on your own e-commerce site. You can use it to empower your other channels, distribution or retail or dealers, whatever they are, in their own e-commerce efforts. Um, it, it really builds your organizational competency around digital commerce but ultimately it needs to fit into a broader digital strategy. Amazon um, is, uh, is really one arm of, a, of an e-commerce approach for a B2B company. So go ahead to the next slide, Tom. So, you know, the story I hear from a lot of manufacturers is, gosh, I get into Amazon, I've lost complete control, or I don't, I don't not proactively managing it. Uh, if I am selling to Amazon as what's called a vendor central or wholesale seller, I have no control over the retail price, I have no control over what Amazon is doing. In some cases, it, heck, it's not even profitable. Amazon won't, won't accept price increases, et cetera. How do you avoid that situation? Well, many companies don't realize that they have options and that taking the right approach can provide a manufacturer with control of retail pricing and content. Number one thing in Amazon, control your brand. Amazon has something called an enhanced, or excuse me, Amazon brand registry that allows you to claim your brand you don't have to sell on Amazon to, to do this. It can be used by brands, manufacturers, distributor, private label to control the content. Uh, and, and again, this is one option. And I, I, I believe that every company should do this that has a brand. They need to control their content. Amazon gets 70% of product search, guys. That's a very significant number. And that's not just B2C, that's also B2B. So let's go to the next bullet here, uh, Tom. 
You can also sell directly on Amazon, and this is you're using Amazon solutions to draw, sell directly to customers. This can be used by brands, manufacturers, distributors to sell while maintaining control. And there's a, there's a method called 3P or third party, also called seller central selling that allows you to control the price in your brand content on Amazon. And then the third option, which many manufacturers are opting for is using those control elements I described, but also leveraging resellers. This is allowing you to use your current distribution network to actually capture the sales on Amazon while controlling the content on Amazon. Amazon has something called the Amazon Business Playbook, which highlights this. We help companies make decisions uh, around these different paths and find the optimal one for your company. But what do you need to be successful? I have one more slide. I want to go to the next one, Tom. Um, you have to you pursue best practices and execution, and it needs to be founded on a solid strategy. Uh, I recognize some of the names on the phone with us today, and you know some of you guys that I've worked with in thinking through this strategy for Amazon. The right selling strategy is foundational, whether that's wholesale or marketplace, the third party approach that I described versus enabling your resellers to sell on your behalf. What is the right path? These are not mutually exclusive either. You can be doing multiples of these paths. What's right for your business? And it varies by manufacturer, but you need certain elements like great content, brand protection, reseller management, we alluded a lot earlier to, um, or Andy, I think alluded to channel management and, and understanding you know, what's happening through your channels and managing channel conflict. You have approaches to that you can implement in Amazon. We help you think through that. Leveraging prime, prime your products, they're prime eligible, convert three to four times non-prime products. Um, you need to be visible in search. There are 600 million products on Amazon. So you need to be using their advertising and optimization tools. And they have quite a few B2B features. Uh, for example, your distributors might have traditionally extended credit to uh, their buyers. Amazon is doing the same thing. Uh, you need the right kinds of resources to execute your program. It's a lot of what we do. But ultimately, Amazon can add millions in very profitable revenue for B2B companies. Some of our clients are generating 20 or $30 million or more per year from Amazon. Uh, and so the potential is there, and it's not just for large companies. So. Um, Tom, I know we're coming up on time. Let's just do a quick summary here. You know, the, the time is now. Uh, COVID-19 is a huge call to action, as we talked about. The first chapter of my book is actually called The Time Is Now. And it's, and it's really, and Andy alluded to this, it's not about waiting for perfect information. Um, and, and, and it's really about taking action. So this B2B buyer has emerged. We're seeing this uh, today. We've made the case there. Are you seeing it in your business? This will sustain. Acting now will drive competitive advantage for you. It's not too late. And it's not about the death of a salesman, but you have to engage that sales channel and the sales team in your process of transformation. Digital is at the core of this. You can deploy an e-commerce pilot platform if you're doing this carefully getting your co-pilots, I love that, Andy, around you, don't do it alone. And the platform choice is really critical. Um, you know, self-promotion here, buy my book and read chapter nine. <laughs> but you'll see that, you know, getting the platform uh, and Znote is a, is, a, is a fantastic choice uh, for this. Uh, getting the right platform in place uh, is important. And then Amazon Business can be a great way to get started and build that organizational muscle around e-commerce. Don't wait for perfect information, guys. The first case study in my book is all about a company called Petra Industries that took action 15 years ago on e-commerce and they're, they're and without the information, perfect information about what it was going to become. You need to get into it and iterate. And that's what a pilot is great for. So I think we maybe have time, Tom, for what? One question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're happened. going to be a little light uh, yeah. on time here. We have about two minutes. We should have one minute. There are no questions that are showing up in the Q&A section of Zoom here. What I'm gonna recommend is, as a follow-up here, because we are out of time, from a housekeeping standpoint, again, we will be sending out a copy of the actual deck, as well as a link to the video of this presentation for anyone who would like to review it. And then we strongly encourage, if anybody does have questions, reach out directly. 
All the information that you need is in this deck. And as you can see, uh, Brian's, Andy's, and my email are here as well. We'll be happy to take any questions offline and connect with you. And we really appreciate anyone, everyone else's time today. So thank you so much. Brian and Andy, uh, any closing words? The time is now. <laughs> take action. Hire a co-pilot. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.